Okay, welcome everybody to another Zoom call. Again, if you have questions, you can chat them in. Um, please make every effort when you do send in your questions to send them in as early as possible. Um, uh, you know, the closer we get to four o'clock, the less chance on certain days for sure that I will even get them into the call. I always look at the members' home page for new information. One of the things that you'll see on the members' home page, because I'm always adding stuff to the courses, always adding stuff to the member page. One of the new things, if you've been on the new on the member home page lately, is this information about getting a glucometer um, and about testing how to test your blood. Using a glucometer, you can buy one on Amazon here. Um, and uh, to take it fasting, you can download the chart right here that I created for you to keep track of your blood glucose, how to test it, and why you want to get your blood glucose down. Even if your cancer isn't completely fed by glycolysis, every cell uses glycolysis to grow and to function, to make ATP. So there isn't a cancer that doesn't use glucolysis to some degree. So um, getting your glucose levels lower is beneficial for everybody with cancer. It's beneficial with everybody if you don't have cancer. So getting your glucose levels down would be great. The goal is 75 or below. Um, if you're doing a ketogenic diet, your goal is to get it even lower than that. Most of you aren't doing a ketogenic diet. I don't know if anybody on this call is doing a ketogenic diet, but um, even if you're not on a keto-like diet, your goal is still to try to get your glucose as low as possible. Now, some of you might be going, oh my gosh, mine doesn't ever get below 90. Well, you just keep working on it. Keep uh, watching your diet to do that. Make sure you look at the different courses. Make sure you look at the, the blog posts. Um, and uh, let's see, this was a question from last time. So first question, I sent in my labs to you, my tumor markers have spiked. Any suggestions? Yes, I saw those last night. Thank you for sending those. I will be starting on mistletoe next week, but my local oncologist wants me on eye brands one more month before he changes anything. Even with those changes in tumor markers, I can't believe he isn't willing to make changes. I would like to do another cheek swab. There are some other things that I've been researching for you. So if you could send in another cheek swab, that would be wonderful. I do a coffee enema daily, seven days per week for about a year now. Is it possible to develop a sensitivity to caffeine? <clears throat> so the answer to that is yes, you can. My fitness band uh, recently noted high heart rate in the evening after doing a coffee enema. Well, you will, if you absorb some caffeine, which you typically will when you do a coffee enema, it will raise your heart rate 150 plus beats per minute. And that to me is too high. I also reduced my thyroid med. Um, I'd like to see your thyroid labs if you have them. Should I stop enemas or continue with less coffee? I would just switch to uh, um, doing uh, enemas with uh, chamomile tea. So just make up, brew up some organic chamomile tea and just switch to that for a week or two and see if that changes on your fitness band. So this fitness band, I think you're talking about is those things that you wear and you can measure your heart rate and stuff like that. Um, I know some of you looked at fitness band and remember that 80s punk band, but no, that's not what he's talking about. I'm just kidding. So uh, yeah, I would change it. I would go less coffee. I would just change it to a chamomile tea enema. Um, and uh, that's that's what I would do. Uh, dosage for panicure with prostate cancer. Uh, dosage for panicure with prostate cancer, I would do one pack. So if you're getting the panicure in the boxes and there's three packs, one gram each of uh, each packet, do one pack a day, start with four days on, three days off, four days on, three days off, 
Um, you could put it in your smoothie. Um, you could mix it straight, but it's better to throw it in your smoothie or your greens or something like that. Um, and it's fairly tasteless. Do four days on, three days off. Uh, uh, that's what I would do for prostate cancer. I was reading three easy steps to clear histamine from your body. Um, that's not an article from me, but this person says, towards the end of the article, it discusses how to treat histamine intolerance. Point three says it's important to find the root cause of the histamine intolerance other than genetics. How do you find a root cause other than genetics of my histamine intolerance? Histamines are a driver of my breast cancer. So we're talking about two different things. So if a person has excess histamine in their body, um, there's multiple possible reasons. Number one is that they have genetic defects so they don't clear histamine very well. Um, and you can't fix those genetic defects. So you're just using things like quercetin and other things to help pull the histamine out of your body. Number two, you can have some inflammatory process that's causing a histamine increase. That's what I think the author of this article is talking about is find the root cause of the histamine intolerance. You can't find the cause of the histamine intolerance. I think what they mean is find what's causing the histamine increase, what's causing the excess histamine. So histamine is an inflammatory marker that stimulates an immune attack in the presence of uh, some uh, something in your body that shouldn't be in your body. So in the case of you have a pathogen in your body, you will stimulate a histamine attack to try to clear that out of your body. It's your way to, it's your um, initial res immune response to a toxin, to a poison, to a pathogen. Um, if it just continues to ramp and your cells continue to make histamine, now that's an issue. Part of that has to do with genetics. Part of that has to do with um, a sensitivity. So let me explain. If I have, if my body has created antibodies against a toxin, let's use an example of um, the toxin in a mosquito bite. I don't know the name of the toxin that the mosquito injects into you when it draws your blood out to use for, you know, whatever purposes the mosquito uses your blood for. But whatever toxin it uses, some people some people go, oh my gosh, when I get a mosquito bite, I have this huge histamine reaction and I itch like crazy and I swell up. And other people like, I go out in the same mosquito infested territory and they don't seem to bother me at all. And um, it can be because the mosquitoes don't necessarily land on you and light on you and bite on you because of your body chemistry. That's a whole other story. But let's say you get just as bit as somebody else or a bug bites or um, you could you could extend this to pollen. You could extend this to poison ivy reaction. You could extend this to other, um, you know, fly reactions and stuff like that. Why are some people more intolerant to those? Why do they? Why do some people have a greater histamine reaction to those? Well, partly it has can be that the that that person's body has made antibodies to that toxin. And because they made antibodies to that toxin, every time that toxin is present, they fire this huge immune reaction because they have antibodies. It's no different than if I have antibodies to uh, gluten, uh, gliadin peptides in gluten. And every time I eat gluten, I fire this reaction. I have this it, you know, this inflammatory process going on in my gut and in my brain and in my bloodstream and everything else. It's because I have antibodies to that peptide of the food. So if I have created antibodies inadvertently to something, that is a major reason why I have histamine reactions. Now, the problem is, is that you can't just make those antibodies go away. Nothing pulls those antibodies out of your body. Some antibodies literally will stay forever, like in the case of gluten, the added antibodies, they don't tend to dissipate. Or if you have antibodies to other foods, if you stay away from that food for a period of time, pretty, you know, many times, many of those foods, the antibodies dissipate quite quickly. And you could do another 
Cyrex 10 test for food antibodies, and those, those are gone. So you don't have sensitivities to that because you stayed away from that for a period of time. Same thing if you do a Cyrex uh, 11 or 12 test, which tests antibodies to chemicals in your environment and other pathogens in your environment, like mold and things. If you clear your body of those things, you're not continually exposed to those things, pretty soon your those antibodies go down and now you're not going to react to that as much. So that's how, if you really want to find out, boy, I have reactions to different things. I know I have histamine as a driver of my breast cancer, doing a Cyrex uh, 10, doing a Cyrex 4 to see if you have antibodies to other foods uh, that are related to gluten the three X related to gluten and, uh, uh, and uh, um, other gluten um, cross reactants in the Cyrex 4, the Cyrex 10, Array 10 is a panel of a whole bunch of different foods. I think a hundred different foods or so cooked and raw to see if they have antibodies to that. So if there, if it's anything that has to do with uh, exposure to foods that's increasing histamines, um, secondly, you could do a Cyrex 11 and a Cyrex 12 that tests for, do I have antibodies to pathogens? Do I have antibodies to um, chemicals in my environment? If I have antibodies to those things and I am exposed to those things, every time I'm exposed to those things, I'm going to create more histamines. Um, so measuring what I should stay away from can be beneficial. So you want more information on that, gladly make an appointment. We can figure out what test would be best to order. Questions about meat and histamines. Is uncured organic turkey breast okay to eat? Um, yes. So typically, um, you, could, you could download the histamine list on um, our website. You can Google a histamine list of different foods. The older a food is, meaning... Um, if it's uh if it's a lunch meat and you and it was you know cooked in um, a week ago and now it's sitting in the grocery store and now you buy it it's going to have greater histamines in it. If you just bought a turkey and cooked up the turkey breast and you ate it, it's going to have a lot less histamines than if you leave it in the fridge for a couple more days and you eat it cold. It's going to have more histamines in it. So the more aged the the product is, it's going to have more histamines. Are organic grass-fed nitrate-free meat sticks like chumps okay to eat? Well, they're going to have some more histamines in it. Now, your histamine problem may be much less related to the amount of histamines that you're eating and more related to foods that you're eating that are creating a histamine reaction, like I explained before. So a person can have issues because they eat foods with a lot of histamines that's less, honestly, that's less of a problem. Unless a person's like, oh my gosh, I have the habit of just eating a whole, um, you know, bowl full of cashews and then a bowl full of strawberries, strawberries, and those are really good for me. Well, they also have a lot of histamines in it. But if that's not your case and you're eating a fairly balanced meal and you're not getting foods that are just so concentrated in histamines, then the reason why you might have a history histamine issue is because your body's making histamines because you have antibodies against things that you're exposed to, whether it be foodborne products or pathogens or chemicals. So those are the things that you want to look at. Sometimes when people have histamine issues, they really get hung up on their diet and think that that's going to solve it. Um, and just staying away from things that have histamine in it may be of little help to a person. It's when they, oh, they're staying away from this. They're only eating this certain food that has very little histamines on the histamine food list, but they actually have antibodies to that food. So every time they eat that food, their body is making histamines to deal with it. So I know that sounds complicated, um, but you know, if you can understand that your body makes histamine and you you're not trying to stop your body from making histamine. You're trying to go, why is my body making histamine against a food? Well, it shouldn't unless you have an antibody against that food or a pathogen uh, unless you have antibodies to that pathogen. Um, so for instance, if a person has antibodies to a mosquito 
the pathogen, the chemical in a mosquito bite, they're not exposed to mosquitoes. They don't have a histamine reaction. It's only happening when they're exposed to that chemical. Hopefully that helps. Is there a Rife program that will boost energy levels? I'm not really. Um, no, I wouldn't. I mean, indirectly, it can help energy levels. I mean, if you're, I would think you, you could run the adrenal program, you could run the um, thyroid program, the pituitary program, that might help with energy levels. Um, uh, but just stimulating your your hormones that your that you know kick in energy, which would be really your adrenals and your pituitary, your thyroid would be the things to run to help with energy with the rife. My previous holistic practitioner said from blood work that I was pre-diabetic. Um, late onset type one. She had me on a couple supplements that were supposed to help regulate my blood sugar. Designs for health, berberine synergy, mitochondrial energy, of which I am no longer taking. I did take this diagnosis very seriously since I had not been symptomatic as far as I knew and felt very good while hungry or uh, intermittent fasting or even fasting for several days, even while I was a vegan this winter. However, I now, in the past two to four weeks, feel like my metabolism is on hyperdrive, and I wake up depleted and weak and lightheaded. So um, understand if you have diabetes, you have the inability to get blood sugar into the cell uh, because of damaged cell membrane receptors, talking about um, uh, uh, type 2 diabetes. If you truly have late onset type 1 diabetes, then you have antibodies to the islet cells of the pancreas that make insulin. So that's a totally different type of diabetes and really a totally different disease, though it'll manifest from a blood sugar level, meaning measuring blood glucose levels with something as simple as a glucometer like this is, is elevated blood glucose, the same as diabetes type 2. So then you have to find out by testing antibody levels whether you have antibodies to pancreatic islet cells. So that's how you would diagnose type 1 diabetes. Uh, if you do have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, um, having a metabolism in hyperdrive really, I mean, it depends on how you're defining metabolism in hyperdrive, but uh, and feel, and waking up feeling depleted and weak and lightheaded really wouldn't be the symptoms necessarily of diabetes. That would be more the symptoms of uh, um, waking up depleted and weak and lightheaded would be more the symptoms of hypoglycemia. And then when you measure your glucose in the morning, you'd have very um, suppressed glucose levels. Takes me a long time in the morning to get enough food for me to keep to feel better. Um, really, again, that's really not the symptom of diabetes. Um, again, the way you diagnose diabetes uh, is technically if you have blood glucose levels, the fasting blood glucose levels of more than one incidence of over 125. Uh, deciliter liters per microgram. So on a blood uh, monitoring sugar, it'd be over 125 where it says 104 on this uh, after a 10 or 12 hour fast. Um, and it has to be more than one instance. This morning I crashed in terrible shaky weak weakness. So that would be signs of hypoglycemia. Um, and that can happen with someone with diabetes, but that happens with somebody with diabetes when they're on insulin and they're taking too much insulin. So it's bringing their blood sugar level too low. So it's a hypoglycemic incense in diabetes because of ex excess use of insulin, not monitoring that well enough. So um, that's what you want to look for. Get yourself a glucometer if you don't have one and start measuring your glucose levels 
um, in the morning at 12 hour minutes, go to the home page of the member site and download that chart and start keeping track of that. Um, I'm supposed to begin chemo next week. Can you imagine surviving this? I'm very fragile. So make sure you monitor that. Get your blood glucose levels and your blood levels balanced um, as best you possibly can. I will be away from home July uh, 19th to August 7th. You suggest I take my wife with me. Uh, I will be in hotels. I'll be flying from Turkey to Switzerland. Uh, what do you tell the agents? Yeah, it's we've had this question lots of times in the past, and really, it really depends on a couple of things. If you're doing really well and you're going to go on a two week vacation, you're doing fantastic. You could certainly do without your right for two weeks. Um, if you're, you know, really struggling and your health is kind of on the precipice, and you're had this family vacation plan for a long time, then I would take my wife with me. Um, but it can be a hassle to travel with, especially if you're overseas in other countries. For the person, I know the person who asked this question, I'd say just leave your wife at home. That's my suggestion. But if someone else asked this question, pretend that they were traveling to other countries like this, I'd still say it's probably better to leave your wife at home if you're gonna bring it through customs each time when you go through to another country. Um, if you're traveling in the United States and you're, you know, you're not, your health isn't like perfect. You're not in full remission. I would say bring your wife with. You don't have any issues traveling with it on the airplane domestically at all. Um, you don't have to tell them anything, um, domestic travel. So, uh, but if you're in remission and you're going to, on a trip for a week, then by all means, you can leave your wife at home for a week. Some of the wife programs say to use a grounding mat. So yes, um, a lot of them do. Don't read what it says on the RIFE program. You don't have to use a grounding mat with any of the RIFE programs except the foot mat. So the Ion Pro Wave is what you really should be using, a grounding mat, because you got your feet in the water. You want to draw those frequencies through your body. That's the whole idea. And the frequencies are going to be attracted to the ground, to the grounding mat, to what is grounding them. That's what a grounding mat is. It attaches it to your outlet, to the ground, literally the ground, the earth outside. So um, the ion pro wave is really the only thing that you need to use the grounding mat with. You can use the grounding mat. We've discussed this at least a hundred times on these Zoom calls about the use of the grounding mat. You only need to use it on the ion pro wave um, if you're going to use a grounding, the grounding sheet in your bed, make sure you put it on the lower half of the bed, underneath the fitted sheet, on top of the mattress. Should I be using it during personal programs and during the night and overnight? No, just on the ion pro wave. Also, I think you said the jackhammer attachment would enable one to be up and about while still receiving frequencies. Yes. You can, if you're using it during the day and you're up and about, but still if the treatment range is still only going five to eight feet. So if you're beyond that range, it's not really, you're not getting a whole lot of benefit from it. But if you're within five to eight feet from it, the majority of time you are getting benefits. So I, you know, I really like the jackhammer for that reason. We include the jackhammer in our newer right purchases um, but if you purchase it prior to us including it, you could purchase one from True Rife. Uh, we don't sell them. They don't give us a discount on it. Um, so you just purchase it right from True Rife. My parotid gland is swollen. The radiologist told me to use a warm compress on it. Ah, the oncologist told me to go to an ENT to see if it needs to be drained. What do you think? I have biotics research, cytosine, parotid tablets, uh, but it's still difficult to do pills because I'm reliant on a feeding tube and crushing them tends to jam that up. Um, so this person got radiation therapy, I believe. And that's what they're talking about here with the parotid gland being swollen. Um, uh, I don't know why they told you to do a warm compress. The, typically, the thing with swelling, you do ice. Um, maybe they're trying to get it to drain. You can do uh, cold 
and for five minutes, then warm for five minutes, cold for five minutes, warm for five minutes. You could try that to get a pumping action through it. That might help. Um, I would try both warm and ice. I would see which one tends to work better for you. Sometimes heat works better for people. It gets things going. Sometimes that just causes more swelling. So you're just going to have to try those things. Have ice handy to do it. Uh, the cytosine parotid will just help rebuild the parotid gland. It's not going to really help get rid of any swelling in there. And he's concerned if there, if there is a pocket of swelling that needs that could be drained, um, that's a possibility, but I haven't really heard that. I, I would go, I would use the ice and heat first and see if you can get things moving. I have found what I believe to be parasites, possibly tapeworms, but not certain of the type. There are so many par rife parasite programs. What would you recommend and how often? Well, like doing any other programming other than what I program for you, um, as I've always said, you just have to play with it. You know, doing a parasite program once or twice isn't going to do anything, you know, any lasting good. You have to do it multiple times to see if it's even going to work for you. I use the parasite all frequencies, six hours long, which is a good one to use a couple of times with the grounding mat and bulb across my lower uh, belly. I need to be rid of them as quickly as possible. The itching is insane and robbing me of sleep and might be contributing to my inability to gain weight. I've seen that wood grade diatomaceous earth, one to two tablespoons in water, garlic, Papaya seeds, pumpkin seeds um, can be helpful for a couple of weeks. Are these fast and effective alone or together? What would you recommend? We have a, a para um, a clear product that we use. Um, it's our private label of PHP's Vermifuge, which I think is the best parasite cleanser because it's just, it's got so many good parasite killers in there. So it'll kill them the widest array of parasites. Going through a bottle of that should be enough to kill most parasites in a person's body. Typically, you can kill parasites fairly quick. Um, doing the parasite all frequencies is my favorite one, the one I would recommend to do. I had an MRI last week. The last one was in September. After four months on the hormone blockers, my tumors and non-mass areas have shrunk about 50%, it seems. Consulting with the surgeon next week to get her opinion on my next step options. The week after, I have tentatively scheduled a consult with Dr. Simmons to get her second opinion on surgery, along with what she would recommend post-surgery. As far as treatment, I'm not likely to opt for radiation, and I know they will want me to keep uh, want to keep me on some kind of hormone blockers. It's likely, with all this feedback, I will schedule a one-on-one -on -one with you, try to help figure out my program from there. Yeah, I would. Um, I'm not a big fan of radiation for breast cancer at all. Um, because you're going through the chest cavity, you're going through the heart, you're affecting major arteries. So I'm not a big fan of radiation for breast cancer. Um, the hormone blockers, if they're tolerable, um, just do work better than, you know, the natural <laughs> hormone blockers. So if you're able to tolerate it and they want to keep you on that, I wouldn't do too much of a pushback if you've seen this good, this um much of a change. I mean, that's a great, that's a 50% reduction is something to be celebrated. I don't want to lose my hair from chemo, but a cold cap seems risky with the tumor so near my hairline. Are there other practices, protocols, supplements that will help me keep my hair? Um, no, not really. Uh, the reason why you lose your hair with chemo is because chemo is going to be attracted to more rapidly replicating cells, hence that it's more attracted to the cancer. Um, but there are other cell lines in your body, that's the catch-22, that are more rapidly replicating, like your hair follicles, like your immune system. So um, 
it's uh you know we've talked about this before that the cold cap kind of thing is really the only thing that's shown a whole lot of viability as far as helping people keep their hair and it's still you know not like that great at keep at working either um and um and then you got to look at you're putting your head in a really cold ice is that good for your brain i don't know maybe it is it's anti-inflammatory maybe but um also the idea of cold therapy during ivs are there other things to decrease the chance of neuropathy in my hands and feet well you know the neuropathy in your hands and feet and further abuse on your body not just your hair follicles after chemotherapy is after 48 hours be running the ion pro wave every day so that will help pull that out and the neuropathy in your hands and feet is because the 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 caustic chemicals of chemotherapy damage your your uh, peripheral nerves and the the damage of those large am amateur a diameter afferents which carry pain and um uh tingling and things are what are damaged and that's why when you get die off of those nerves you end up with neuropathy if cold repels chemo uh might heat draw it um well cold doesn't repel chemo so uh cold decreases um circulation um and heat will increase circulation so hence the question you know back here where where the person's talking about wherever it was this one with the swelling at the prodigal gland and the person and the radiologist saying to put a warm compress on it i think the radiologist thinking warm compress trying to get flow limp flow and have it get flowing but typically let's say you sprain your ankle what do you do when you sprain your ankle you don't you don't um you know put heat on it i mean it would just blow up like a balloon and you would just be dying in pain you put ice on it um and the idea is that ice decreases the inflammation ice will decrease the blood flow because it's the blood flow to the area that then will leak different cytokines and immune uh, particles to to and, and histamine that fires this inflammatory reaction so um the idea of using cold is you're decreasing blood flow to the scalp therefore um you're not repelling the chemo but you're decreasing the circulation the chemo is circulating through your blood vessels so if you can decrease the circulation to that area you're going to hence decrease the amount of chemo to that area. My heating pain on my neck during the IVs help pull the chemo to the tumors. Um, it's not necessary and it might cause swelling. So if your oncologist doesn't recommend it, I wouldn't recommend it. I've never heard anybody using heat at the site of the cancer to, to increase the circulation to the cancer. Um, it, I don't think that's what's recommended. Are there practices, protocols, supplements that might help with the impending chemo, these uh, symptoms? Look at our chemo protocol on our blog post. We have a chemo protocol. There's nothing that's going to be perfect with any of these. Um, uh, and every single person is different. The whole idea is that you want the chemo to work. So you're staying away from antioxidants. Um, before you do the chemo and for 48 hours after the chemo IV is finished, you're staying away from antioxidants. You do a 24-hour water fast. So you're only drinking water for 24 hours prior to the IV of the chemo. Um, when you're done with the chemo, you can go home and eat something. And then you're after 48 hours, you're hitting the antioxidants, you're doing the ion pro waves, you're supporting liver detox pathways. Look at that seven phases of detox um, course to look at how you could support the detox pathways as best as possible. That's what's going to help with all these things. All these are side effects that are affecting the chemo is affecting other organs. If you can get the chemo to work at the cancer when it really is going to be best to be working at the cancer, which is within the first 48 hours 
of doing the chemo and then try to help your body detoxify it afterwards is the key. I used to do oil pulling, but I've gotten out of the habit. So my rule was oil pulling. That's when you swash um, coconut oil or olive oil in your mouth for 10 to 15 minutes and then you spit it out of the sink. Help pull toxins out of your mouth, out of your gums. Uh, it can be very beneficial, but you do not do oil pulling if you have any mercury fillings in your mouth. That's an absolute no-no. So if you have any mercury fillings, any silver fillings in your mouth, you do not do oil pulling. That could make you worse, systemically worse. Oh, I don't have any oil, uh, mercury fillings, pretend. Well, then you can go back to doing oil pulling. There's nothing wrong with that. Should it be a good systematically as well, systemically, I think, as well as tumor in my throat? It can be good to do oil pulling as long as you don't have any um, silver fillings. What kind of oil? Um, Oral Wellness has an oil pulling. Oil Designs for Health has a new oil pulling oil that you can use, but you could use coconut oil. You could use olive oil. It's really no secret to what oil you use. Typically, coconut oil or olive oil is what you would use. Do binders decrease food and supplement effectiveness? When should they be taken? Uh, typically, binders don't. Uh, um, you know, people will argue that binders can grab onto your minerals, which they can. Um, and some people will say, don't take binders when you're taking other, you know, at the same time you're taking other supplements. Um, there may be some truths of that. It does have some, make some sense. So you could choose to take binders at different times of the day that you're not taking your supplements, taking them away from other times you're taking supplements. Typically, I'm not that particular with that. I don't think that goes on all that much. I don't think the binders have an affinity towards your nutrients. So I don't think that is as much of a problem. Oh, when I take my Chinese herbs and rife, I feel much better without adding the many supplements. Soon I will get a cheek swab. Perhaps you we can simplify the supplements. Okay. That's good. Did Royal Rife machine kill cancer cell quickly? Um, well, there really wasn't any way to document what Royal Rife did. And a lot of the things that he wrote down and did document have been lost. So we don't we don't know how fast um, uh, the cancer died. And everybody is different. That's just the truth. I mean, we've had people miraculously cured lots of people miraculously cured with the rife and we've had people that it seemingly did nothing so um everybody is different everybody's going to respond differently everybody's body is different everybody's physiology is unique and you just got to keep moving forward as best you possibly can what is your opinion about the uh thymosin alpha 1 peptide for the immune system um i'm not a big fan of using peptide uh, therapy. Um, um, it, it can stimulate growth. And that is why most people use peptide therapy is because it stimulates growth and it, it stimulates more youthfulness. Um, I've always shied away from peptide therapy. I've read several books on peptide therapy. It really doesn't, to me, make sense for cancer patients. Another practitioner wants me to start hydrogen peroxide. What are your thoughts with this? I'll be starting mistletoe, not sure what to do. I wrote a blog post on hydrogen peroxide um, that you might want to look to. When, when you say another practitioner is wanting you to start hydrogen peroxide, I, I think you're just saying that you're doing oral hydrogen peroxide. So. Hydrogen peroxide um, uh, for, uh, let, me, let me share my screen here a second. Uh, change my screen share real quick. Um, so you can see 
my screen now. This is the blog post, Hydrogen Peroxide for Cancer Not So Fast. Um, and watch this video that I did on hydrogen peroxide. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, making it an unstable molecule. Well, that's the benefit of hydrogen peroxide. It's an unstable molecule. It will give an oxygen away. It's a, it's not an oxygenizing uh, product. It's an oxidant, just like chemotherapy is an oxidant. But hydrogen peroxide is not a stable oxidant. So when you do hydrogen peroxide orally, you are gonna, you could kill bacteria in your gut. Um, well, that could be a good thing or a bad thing because you could actually disrupt your flora of your bacteria. Hydrogen peroxide is not going to be absorbed into your bloodstream and circulate around and go to the cancer and then give its oxygen to the cancer and oxidate the cancer, killing the cancer. It's just not going to do that. Just, you know, so when, when there's when there's alternative practitioners, practitioners that say use hydrogen peroxide orally, it, you know, this is where I struggle because you're not understanding some basic physiology. Hydrogen peroxide is great as an oxidant, an oxidizing agent that will kill bacteria and viruses topically because it will readily give off that other oxygen, which is an O negative molecule, and it will attach to a cell membrane of a bacteria, uh, and it will kill by the, by the act of, of uh, being a um, oxidizing agent to damage the cell membrane and it destroys it. That's what a poison is. So uh, that's how chemotherapy works. It's a poison. It's an oxidizing agent that, that is a poison. That's how uh, hydrogen peroxide is. If you drink uh, food grade 35% hydrogen peroxide, you could kill yourself. Now, we're just not going to take that much. We're going to take a lower dose. Well, are you really, you're not killing the cancer because it's not stable enough to be, um, to travel and be absorbed into the, you know, through the gut wall, into the bloodstream and travel to the cancer and then give off its oxygen there. So it may, to me, it makes, okay, if I had, maybe if I had stomach cancer, maybe using, you know, hydrogen peroxide might be an option. Um, but it, there's dangers to that too, because it's a toxin. So you have to be really careful with that. So I, even with stomach cancer, I, I wouldn't recommend it because um, there's just too many, there's too many downsides. You could, you could kill the patient. So I'm not a fan of hydroperoxide. So you can read my article about that there. Um, um, I mentioned I used the H. pylori program in my life and it started passing five inch worms. I saved and took it to my doctor. He said it looked like a scarus roundworm. Oh, how fun is that? I bought five boxes of your fenbendazole. He gave me a script for albendazole, two pills. Is there a difference? You know, I don't, you'd have to Google that, search that. I'm not familiar. I think it's the same product. This is just the fenbendazole is the name of the product that is used for animals. Uh, this is the human form. It is probably a much higher dose. That's the difference. The fenbendazole boxes that, that we sell in our store are for a 10 pound dog. That is a cancer treatment, not really a parasite treatment. Even though it's a parasite pill, it's an off-label use of that medication it's over the counter, so we feel free to sell it. So that's really the difference. Uh, does my whole family, including the dog, need to be treated? Uh, not really. Um, uh, if it is a roundworm, um, it is really passed through feces and contact with feces. H. pylori itself is different. H. pylori isn't a roundworm. It's not a worm. It's not a tapeworm. It's a small little parasite. Uh, and it is passed through oral transmission as well. So if you kiss your kids, you can pass uh, H. pylori. So that, we're not talking about H. pylori, though. No. So 
No, but in the case of H. pylori, then yes, you do want to work on treating the whole family, including the family pets, but not with Romer. If Rife is killing them, do uh, you still say it's best to take the benbendazole? Make sure they are all gone. Love to know your thoughts on this before I start. Yeah, I you know I would not feel bad about taking a medication as as well as doing the parasite program, uh, the H. pylori program. I don't think there's wrong with taking that. Doing the Paraclear, you could try that. I mean, if you're afraid of side effects of this medication that is recommended because it is much higher dose, I'm sure than the benbendazole boxes. You could try just doing the fenbendazole boxes instead, doing a much, much lower dose. You might have just as good a results. If the worms could go to the brain, no, I don't think these roundworms could go to the brain. I don't think there's a danger of that. I think they're mainly just in the gut. Should I put the rife on my head for parasites in case they have gone to the No, I wouldn't be concerned really with that. Would you agree that a cold cap for head and neck cancer is a bad idea or would it be safe? Talk to your oncologist about that. I'm not the person really to discuss that. They can actually um, give you a prescription for that, I think, too. So I think you can get it paid through your insurance. So I would check on that. Now, back to the parasite thing. There are parasites that go to your brain. You know, I had one patient years ago that had um, migraines that were happening five days a week went to Mayo, went everywhere. She was about ready to jump off a bridge, tested her, and it actually came back, um, uh, the parasite that you get from pork, and um, which was really weird. And I asked her where she could have gotten it, which she could get anywhere. But she ended up doing, uh, saying that this all started when she went to Mexico and ate uh, some street food there. We gave her... Um, a parasite, like I think we gave her probermafuge at the time, this was years ago, and, and within a week, her headache went away, so it was pretty crazy. In December, I had a $500 gut zoomer test through another practitioner that said I had no parasites. I've been using um, human fed bendazole, uh, 220 grams, uh, milligrams twice a day for months. However, I still have parasites. Um, yeah, I don't know, um, what parasites that you're passing you, um, um, and I don't know what fenbendazole, what parasites fenbendazole is the best for. So, um, if, you know, the, those, the gut, the parasite, uh, I'm not familiar with the Zoomer tests. We don't use that lab. Um, but I assume this was a stool sample test. Um, and the stool sample tests can miss things too. So, and your body can change. So if, if in December you had this test and it was negative, you could have picked up the parasite right after that. They reproduce quite quickly. So um, that doesn't really convince me that there's a, not a problem. Um, and taking this, the fenbendazole, doesn't convince me that it's going to solve every parasite problem either. Um, yeah, you know, the, these are most of the drugs out there are specific to just certain classes of parasites. Um, and that's all they really kill. That's why there are so many different medication medications for different parasites. You might want to Google the milk cleanse that got rid of my parasites. So that's interesting. Um, and look at that. Thank you for that insight as well. You know, there is a, not to be um, oh, totally, um, I just want to throw in a, another line of thought. There's a whole line of thought that, that uh, uh, parasites are, um, are, are not necessarily always a bad thing. We always think of having parasites as a bad thing. Um, there is uh, there is actually a company that you could actually buy capsules that have live parasites in them and you take them in order to create a parasitic infection because it has been shown through um, different studies that people with 
severe autoimmune diseases, if they're exposed to parasites, can actually help calm down the autoimmune disease. Um, so there is actually a therapy that using parasites to your advantage um, in a symbiotic relationship. And the idea that, um, hey, parasites um, can actually work to our advantage. Now, I know we're all grossed out about parasites. We want to get rid of parasites. The truth is, there's a study done a few years ago that I thought was kind of interesting that said anybody in the northern states, they did the study comparing people in the United States in different areas. Anybody in northern states, and I can't remember what they classified as northern states, whether it, it stayed below freezing for X amount of months of the year. Um, so people in the northern states, they found that 35% of the people they tested had parasites. The people in the southern states, um, because the, the ground doesn't freeze, so there's a greater concentration of parasites, um, they showed that 90% of the people tested had parasites. So the idea is that just because you have a parasite doesn't necessarily mean that you have to work at getting rid of the parasite or that the parasite is causing you ill health. Just think about that a little bit. Just because a person has a parasite doesn't mean that the parasite or parasites are the culprits that are causing ill health. And I would argue, and I talk about this in the autoimmune course, that it is really, the problem really comes in with parasites is when you've actually created antibodies to the parasites. When you create antibodies to the pathogen, that's when you have a problem it's not the path so much the pathogen itself. Just like you go out and you get mosquito bites. Oh, I got a mosquito bite. It itches for a couple of minutes or a day and it's gone. Because I don't have antibodies to that venom of the mosquito, then I don't have really much of a problem with it. It's when you have antibodies to that thing that it really causes health issues. Just another point of view, not to be such a contrarian, but it's something to think about. Do you have any idea why hot flashes are worse at night? Well, hot flashes are caused from um, a sudden um, uh, down regulation of estrogen. Um, that's what hot flashes are. So when you have your estrogen at a balance and it just drops, that's when you get this hot flash. Um, so when you have these bumps up and down of estrogen as a person's going through menopause or a person's on hormone blocking pill, that's what are, that's what is causing uh, hot flashes. I've asked both my oncologists and neither know. Uh, any guesses? It's really, that is that is the etiology of a hot flash. So I'm not sure what I'll do about the hormone blockers because my sleep is wrecked. And as I said last week, I think it is raising my glucose level. That can't be healthy. Also concerned about long-term cardiac and bone health. Um, we'll see what they say um, and we'll figure it out. Yes, I do. I am very impressed with 50% reduction of your tumor. So that's really exciting. I think they might be tapeworms. You know what the old treatment of tapeworms when they start to come out your bottom? This is really gross that you're supposed to grab them very carefully and slowly tug them and put them, wrap them around a pencil and you slowly wind them up because the head of the tapeworm, which is the last thing to come out, can reproduce more and more pieces of a tapeworm. So you want to get the head out. So you have to go very slow and wrap them around the pencil and you roll them up. Just what you wanted to hear. But do you know why sudden drops of estrogen occur at night? It's probably because it has to do with your circadian rhythm of your normal estrogen. Your 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 when you're taking an estrogen blocker, you're not removing your you know you're not going in and surgically removing your ovaries so that you don't have anything creating estrogen. So your ovaries are trying to kick in. Remember, your hormones are released on both a circadian rhythm and they're re released on a negative feedback loop. So a circadian rhythm is when you have this normal flow of different times of the day where you release your hormones. Like for instance, thyroid hormone is released in the morning 
and then it tapers off during the night. And it's typically T4 and T3 that is released and mainly T4, 90%. Then it's converted in the gut to T3. Uh, same thing with your estrogen and progesterone. It's released at different times of the day, depending upon your cycle, even if you're not cycling anymore. So um, it will still change throughout the month how it's released. When you still have your ovaries and you're on an estrogen blocking pill, you're still going to get some spikes of estrogen and then the estrogen blocking pill is going to pull it out of you and it's going to drop. So it really has to do with your rhythm. You're probably getting more of a release of estrogen at night and it's pulled out. So you're getting a spike downward or a sudden drop um, in estrogen. And that's what's causing your issues at night. That would be my guess. What I'm seeing are about an inch long, and there are multiple ones. I've sent a photo to you in an email. I have extreme rectal itching. Um, what you can do, uh, the other medical treatment for identifying a parasite is you have to use some clear tape, and you have to put some tape on your rectum and uh, many times you will do this at night and you'll go in at night and put tape on your rectum and pull it off. And hopefully you'll have some of the eggs or pieces of the, of the parasite that then can be identified through a parasitologist under a microscope and identify what type of parasite it is. So parasites an inch long that, I, you know, unless you're getting just pieces of a tapeworm or something, um, tapeworms are very long. When checking blood glucose levels, is this random or between meals or fasting? Nope. So go back to the member site um, and uh, the home page of the member site, it states a fasting morning reading of one's glucose levels can be a great indication that a cancer is not being fed through gobbling up sugar. So if you can keep your glucose levels down, everybody's cancer is going to have, is going to be fed by glucose to some degree. Why? Because Every cell uses glycolysis in order to make ATP. So ATP is your main energy source for every cell function, including muscle function and everything else. So keeping your blood glucose levels as low as possible is a benefit to everybody with cancer. And like I said before, even if you don't have cancer, so we want to set a goal to get our fasting, like a 10 or 12 hour fast, fasting goal of blood glucose down to 75 or less. Now that's a pretty handsome goal. Uh, most of you won't be able to accomplish that goal, um, but that's a goal. I mean, you have to have a goal that's hard to match or it's not really a goal. So it's best measured by taking your morning, first morning reading when you wake up before you eat anything or drink anything with a glucometer such as this. You can buy them at Target or Walmart or something like that. Uh, this is one that's on um, Amazon and I gave the link here. Comes with a hundred of these test strips. So take your fasting morning reading and record it on this chart. You can download that chart on the member site. You can do it daily. Your finger starts to get sore and your blood sugar is kind of staying at a same level every day. Then you could, you know, wait and take it every three days or whatever down to weekly. And your goal is to get it down, you know, as low as reasonable. How do I know uh, if I need to do a gallbladder cleanse? Is the apple juice a concern due to high sugar content? Honestly, you know, with everything that you have going on right now, doing a gallbladder cleanse should be the uh, the back burner. You, that's not something that you should, uh, honestly, that I'd be concerned with at all. 
What is the address to send all my blood work and photos to? Always send your stuff to labs, L-A-B-S, at Connors Clinic or info at Connors Clinic. And remember, Connors is spelled, spelled E-R-S. Info at Connors Clinic or labs at Connors Clinic. And remember, all that information is on the member site. So go to the member site and you can look at the labs section and send it to the labs there. All right, we'll finish up today's Zoom call. Thanks for being on. Know that I'm praying for you all and hang in there and be patient in the Lord. Be trusting him in all things. Be praying, you know, for wisdom and knowledge and peace that passes all understanding and trust him for the outcome of everything you're doing because he is your healer. He is your sustainer of life and he needs to be the one that you are relying on. All right, bye-bye.